Podcasts is a recently released Halo novel that is fun to read and captivating. Honestly, it stands out amongst Halo novels for some very jaw-dropping creativity that draws from various elements of Halo lore. In a lot of ways, it felt like a love letter to previous Halo games and books. From murals depicting the events of the third game, to returning characters and plot points from various books like Oblivion. To top that off, huge lore revelations were given to us that has me for the first time since Rubicon Protocol was released more than a year ago, actually excited to see what comes next for Halo's books and games. Actually, Outcast was such an enjoyable read for me that I have received a lot of inspiration for my own book and other stories. I'm not joking, I have probably written at least 30 to 40 pages in the last two weeks alone, which I mean, I read a lot, but usually the number of pages I write in a month are about that number, meaning I'm writing at double the pace. Sometimes I would take a shower, slip into bed, and open up the book for some relaxing reading, and the book would get me so damn excited to write. I would basically just say, well, I guess I'm not sleeping tonight. I would literally put outcasts down to scratch my writing itch, which is why it took me so long to finish reading it. I either couldn't put it down, or I was so giddy I just needed to go sit down at my desk and write. I literally had my mother come in one morning, and it was 8am, she's looking at me like I'm insane, and in part I am because sleeping is not easy for me, especially when I'm inspired. But anyways, the point is, Outcast is easily up there with my favorite Halo novels now. And if I seem excited to talk about the book, that's because I am. At first I was content to just make a video essay, breaking down what I liked, the lore I found interesting, and maybe offer up a point of criticism now and again, assuming I would find any, and honestly I didn't, I just... I, I just love the book. But I actually got to interview Troy Denning about Outcasts, how he writes, and that was definitely one of the coolest Halo experiences I've had. Plus, I gotta say, I learned a lot about writing from him, I've got some things I want to try, and he's a really chill and interesting person. So stick around for that. My excited ramblings aside, let's dive into the book, and of course, before we start, spoilers are inbound, so be warned, here is your mandated spoiler warning timer for about 10 seconds. Halo Outcasts has a fairly simple premise with many moving parts, all of which the reader is able to keep track of. Now, the premise, as stated, is simple. Cortana is solidifying her totalitarian regime and our two primary protagonists of the book, Thelvadam, the Arbiter, and Spartan Olympia Vale, have very little in the way of actually countering her. In Thel's case, he had to deal with the humiliation of surrendering both his and his security details weapons to Cortana's Prometheans, who had just leveled a tenement island within view of his estate. And in the case of Vale, she has been left behind on St. Helios as both a representative for what remains of the UNSC and Oni, while also officially being nothing more than a marooned guest of the Arbiter. This is a very abbreviated and oversimplified version of their circumstances, as those circumstances are much more perilous and complex than I have described. However, you can boil that down to the summary above, as it is all neat and easy to understand at the end of the day. Well, moving back a few paces, there is a reason for the Tenement Island's destruction. A human woman, Kili Iyuska, was on Singhelios attempting to hide from a Singheli Oath Warden by the name of Ayomu. Sorry for the bad pronunciations, that's just how it's gonna be. Simply put, an Oath Warden is more or less an individual that enforces oaths, or as Ayomu describes it, imposes honesty. His client had made a deal with Ayuska, who, at the last minute, went back on her word. He was using drones to track his quarry when he inadvertently caused an incident. Incubating females in Healy were alarmed by the drones, and their spouses angrily opened fire on Ayomu's floating eyes. The plasma fire drew the attention of the Prometheans, a firefight ensued, and needless to say, Ayomu wound up at the Arbiter's doorstep for a meeting, where he had to defend his actions, and he was kind of manipulative, which Thel saw right through, but more importantly, Ayomu revealed some very important information. The planet Nba, or Netherop, as you might remember from previous stories, 
once hosted a civilization that warded off or destroyed a Forerunner Guardian during times long past. Ayusuka was supposed to assist Ayumu's client with the expedition, thus giving that client first pickings. As an Oath Warden, he was simply enforcing the contract. This, of course, spurred the Arbiter into action, as the prospect of a Guardian killing weapon was too significant to leave to chance. In the meantime, Kili Ayuska was seeking out Vale, where she then told Vale about the possibility of the weapon. This essentially started and I say this with a ton of love, the greatest space Indiana Jones story arc I have ever seen. But it was more than just sneak past created, go to planet, steal treasure, use treasure. It was a race. You see, the UNSC and Swords of St. Helios are allies in name only. This is not a healthy relationship between factions, even though officially they're actually pretty neat with each other. Honestly, the UNSC and Swords of St. Helios are like the galaxy's most toxic couple. They're really nice to each other in public, but behind closed doors, they distrust and sometimes actively hurt each other. As an example, the Office of Naval Intelligence basically played a major hand in inciting the civil wars that gripped the Sangheili, and then the UNSC sent the Infinity to play the hero because, to quote the Arbiter's very, very understandably bitter view on it, the humans wanted their loyal pet leading the Sangheili. And in humanity's case, can you really blame their actions? Remember, the Sangheili played one of the largest roles in the Covenant War, or the War of Annihilation, which saw most of the human sphere torched, the UNSC Navy shattered, a sizable portion of the human population dead, and humanity has been facing the prospect of extinction since 2525. There's a very good reason Oni did what it did, immoral as it was. So here you have two groups that are allies on paper, mutually distrusting one another. One wants to preserve Sangheili independence and furthermore protect the Sangheili from the machinations of Oni or other groups. The other wants to secure itself and frankly, with all the trauma humankind has endured, it would never ever reasonably feel safe unless it was the one with that weapon. So instead of working together, it swiftly became a race. So to summarize. Cortana is a near omniscient but not fully omniscient AI, and her created are always, always watching while hanging the threat of destruction by commandeered foreigner tech over everyone's heads. An Oath Warden is working for an unknown benefactor to catch a human woman who has information regarding a potential Guardian killing weapon. The Oath Warden talks to the Arbiter, the human researcher Ayuska talks the Veil. The Swords of St. Helios are set off on their clandestine expedition to Netherop, and of course the UNSC, more like Oni really, does the exact same. And I won't get the entire story summarized, but I want to go into detail for the book's opening chapters, because they did establish the basic premise. At the end of the day, without looking into things, this is just a race between groups to find a weapon that can help them obtain their goals. However, what makes this interesting is the various factors at play here. On its own, the premise is fun, but would it really stand out if the entire book was just Vale and the Arbiter racing for a MacGuffin? No. Yes, this story is a space Indiana Jones story arc, but unlike most of the Indiana Jones films, this book has a thing called depth. Honestly, the thing that ties this whole book together, this entire book, is Ayomu and Kili. These two characters honestly stuck out to me more than Vale and the Arbiter. That isn't because Vale or the Arbiter were boring. Actually, they were really fun and enjoyable. After Halo 5, it's refreshing to see these two characters given some legitimate justice in the current setting of Halo. But I say Ayomu and Kili were the best parts of the book for me because not only does the book not really happen without them, they're just fascinating. The concept of an Oath Warden is awesome. It is a very unique and fun addition to the Sangheili with an unexpected twist. 
Oftentimes, the Sanghili are presented in a very honor-bound role, which makes sense. I mean, they're so hardcore with that honor that tools such as poison are looked down upon, and most warriors will suffer through what could very well be life-threatening wounds because a doctor treating them would be a stain on that honor. So what happens when someone doesn't keep their word? What happens when someone's word, someone's honor, someone's oath is broken. Well, you call an Oath Warden, and you would expect an enforcer like this to be respected, but no, Oath Wardens are not, because an Oath Warden isn't imposing honesty for the sake of honor, they are doing it because they get paid to do it. They are a mercenary. Furthermore, their methods and techniques are unorthodox, and as displayed by Iomu, downright shameful to the Sangheili. Even Thel, who is very progressive by Sangheili standards, looks at Oath Wardens with disdain, and instead of getting defensive or firm like you normally expect Sangheili to be, he is the opposite. He is reserved, observant, crafting, cunning, and more. Furthermore, with him being present in the story, this allows for the introduction of his client, which later turns out to be the Banished. On the other hand, you have Kili Iyusuka, who is arguably equally selfish. Like Ayomu, she views herself as in the right, but at least, by my understanding of her character, she has some very self-serving motivations. She is an ambitious researcher who is clearly very much glory-hounding. That gets her into trouble because she strikes a deal with the Banished foolishly, and when she tries to back out, Ayomu gets involved. This leads to an interesting dynamic. This isn't just a case of these two characters only serve as a means of furthering the plot. No, they add to the story and flesh out the various elements of the cast very well. Ayomu serves to show the political tightrope the Arbiter must walk. The Arbiter has to somehow balance the ingrained culture of the Sangheili with his own personal morals, beliefs, politics, and sometimes he has to weigh all of these against the greater good of his own species. It demonstrates both his skills as a leader, his mental fortitude, and his own personal struggles. Ayomu, being an Oath Warden, really puts a ton of strain on all of these elements. Ayomu also isn't a flat character, atop his motivations being that of personal gain, he also has his own beliefs and opinions. He doesn't view his work as dishonorable, and even views himself as equivalent to or greater than other parts of Sanghili society which he views as close-minded. But he isn't arrogant, not verbally at least. His actions portray a level of arrogance and confidence and a tad bit of an inflated ego, coupled with the condescending way he speaks to others at times. That is clear for sure. However, what makes him stand out is that he doesn't boast. He doesn't say things to prove himself because he doesn't feel the need to. He's perfectly at peace of mind with himself and sees no other reason to justify his actions to others who, again, he views as close-minded and stuck in the past. For that matter, Keely is on the complete opposite end of the spectrum. She is reckless, sometimes loud, feels the need to justify herself, will argue with Vale and even project her own insecurities and flaws onto the Spartan, to the point that she will start a scene, but she isn't annoying, she just comes across as an individual that wants to do great things, wants to achieve her goals, but she bit off a lot more than she could chew, and well, now she's panicking. She's excited that maybe, just maybe, she will realize her personal goals. This excitement and passion for her field work can even override her fear of danger but simultaneously, she is under a lot of pressure. She isn't a trained soldier that can fight. She isn't an orbital drop shock trooper or UNSC marine. She is most certainly not a Spartan clad in power armor. She is just a normal civilian woman. Another note that might add just a whole other layer onto this onion is Keeley's relationship to Vale. The two have a history and a significant one which contributes to their constant bickering. It's very subtle. Very, very subtle, but I think the two were at some point in their lives romantically involved. Now, of course, we as the readers know right off the bat that they knew each other from the time they were teenagers. This adds a lot to this dynamic duo, to the point that Keeley even has a nickname for Vale, 
Pia. Pia. I don't really... I'm just gonna say Pia. Now, friends call each other things all the time, but there are easy to miss lines and gestures between the two that an attentive reader will pick up on. From small acts of touch, such as Keely right off the bat gently holding Vale's arm, to pretty quick but obvious statements. My favorite interaction being, and I quote, Well, I doubt it's because you want to make out. Lovely as that sounds, not really. Comments like these, interactions like these, when noticed completely change the way a reader views the two characters. Without them, this is already an engaging and interesting social dynamic. So having this makes it so much more. Taking a good set of characters and a good dynamic and making them a great set of characters and a great dynamic. With these lines and implications in mind, the reader is able to read between those lines. As an example, I personally guess that the distance gained between them and Keeley's admittedly somewhat toxic, compulsive need to be right, well, I imagine that maybe Vale fell out of love and ended the relationship. She moved on, but maybe Keeley never got over it or she just didn't process it and talking to Vale now reopened old wounds. Bear in mind, I'm not saying that's what happened, but the fact that I as a reader can effectively draw my own conclusions just from a few actions and lines of dialogue really shows how good this book is at establishing interactions and relationships between characters. Every single character, even the minor characters, have their own motivations, feelings, emotions, quirks, oddities, features. This is shown perfectly with Atriox. Atriox, as we have seen with other pieces of Halo media, doesn't oorah and charge. His experiences with the Covenant War have, at least in my eyes, made him somewhat reserved and shrewd as a leader, and that makes him the most dangerous Jirohaine in the galaxy. He bides his time, he waits, he observes. In a way, I would suppose Iomu is similar to Atriox in terms of how he is observant and cunning, a brilliant warrior with unique talents. However, Unlike Iomu, Atriox is far more ruthless and dangerous. He is brutish, but he is not brash, he is not impulsive. And what makes Atriox stand out is that he channels that brutish nature into enforcing an interesting quality within the Banished. Don't do your job right, dead, you're dead. And if you don't do it right, th th that's it. You're just dead. Atriox will make sure he finds someone that can replace you and do your job better than you, and if they can't do their job right, well they're dead too, and he's just gonna keep going through them until he finds someone that does the job right. It is his nature and approach that makes the banished a force to be reckoned with. And Atriox's philosophy of observe, take opportunity, and promote strength has clearly taken on an almost mythical status within Halo Infinite. I would say Atriox's character was at his best in this book, to the point that I was surprised at how right his character felt while reading. I haven't even gotten into the plethora of other things. As an example, with the return to Netherop comes a return to the planet's story. It's been decades since we last visited it. There were a few things left unanswered prior to Outcast. As an example, what happens to characters like Nizat or Petrov? Well, as it turns out, for the UNSC and Covenant forces marooned on the planet, the war never ended. They have been continuing to fight all this time to the point that in Petrov's case, she is a mother, she raised children who then grew up to fight these surviving coveys. And so seeing this survivalist, multi-generational group of marines who still think the war is going on, go up against the Arbiter and Swords of Singhelios in a brief skirmish, and then seeing them just have their minds blown by the Arbiter being willing to talk to them, it was so awesome. And seeing Petrov now having to contend with a new galaxy and come to accept that, yes, the giant lizard in golden armor is in fact not trying to kill her and her children, is such an amazing and fun twist on a character that could have easily been written off. And I should note, Petrov is not the only character from Blue Team's Nethrop Adventures making a return. But why Nethrop? Why is Nethrop important again? Well, that's because nobody really had the time to actually inspect it during the war because, well, <laughs> there were more pressing matters at the time, you know? Like a genocide on one side, and preventing a genocide on the other? Furthermore, anything of note on the planet was simply put, 
hidden by the design of its ancient makers. Because remember, there is supposedly a guardian killing weapon there. Now, seeing as this video is getting to be a little long, I still have to do the interview, I won't go too in depth, but what I will say is that Outcast's use of Halo lore is excellent. Atop previous books being made relevant again, Outcasts use a little bit of everything, and to say the least, the little lore nerd in me was giddy. We have seen some of the most unique and incredible uses of technology in this book, and that is in part because this tech is tier zero, and as you continue to read the book, you get to learn a little about its makers, the nothing, the voices. They chose not to exist. And so that is why nobody ever actually noticed anything on Nethrop for the longest time, because they didn't want anybody to know that, yeah, they were a thing. And for that matter, this has some huge implications for Halo lore. And the final part of the book, the epilogue, so to speak, well, let us just say that this entire book was sweetness everlasting. So, now for the questions. I had reached out to Mr. Denning on Twitter, I refuse to call it X, and asked my questions there. And I got my answers via email. So, here we go. Question 1. Your description of environments is very vivid. How do you approach writing them? When planning a book, I try to select a setting that will enrich and support its themes. Then, as I'm preparing each chapter, I ask myself how it will affect the characters and action. This wires the setting into the bones of the story, which makes it easier to thread in little details as I write. And I try to live in my characters' heads and describe not only what they're seeing, but what they're hearing and smelling. If it's appropriate for the action, I might even mention what they're touching or tasting. It's important to be careful about this kind of detail. It's easy to bog down the action with too much description, but sprinkling in a few tidbits can really help a reader live inside the narrative. Question 2. Halo has had many unique additions over the years. This book has had some of the most standout elements to it that I've seen in Halo's novels. How do you approach creating new and mysterious factors, environments, or objects? Research, research, research. The most important and probably most unique element of this book, the nothing, or the voices if you prefer, harken back to Greg Bear's wonderful Forerunner trilogy. The nano dust that makes the tell such a formidable weapon is my take on the dust, into which the precursors transformed themselves before it was corrupted and became the flood. If you stop and ask yourself what that stuff really was, nanotech is a likely answer. And once you have tier zero nanotech, well, it's as close to magic as you can come in hard science fiction. It would be an exaggeration to say that anything is possible, but you had better do your research before saying something is impossible. Question 3. What is your favorite aspect of writing science fiction, Halo, or otherwise? To answer that question, we have to start with why I like writing fiction of any kind. The old saying, you only have one life to live, doesn't apply to novelists. If we are doing it right, we can live as many lives as we can write because it's impossible to create an engaging character without becoming that character. So I can become anything I can imagine. A detective, a smuggler, an alien warlord. Who wouldn't enjoy that kind of freedom? Why do I write science fiction? Of all the things that interests me in life, I am most curious about the interaction between mankind and technology. We live in a time when the impossible keeps becoming the mundane. I was born in the same decade that DNA's double helix structure was discovered, before the first astronaut had orbited Earth, when computers ran on punch cards and vacuum tubes. Now we have the ability to edit genes in utero. The first footprints on the moon are more than 50 years old, and we have robots roaming Mars. Space probes are crossing interstellar space, and machines are learning to think for themselves. Before long, I suspect we'll be using nanoparticle injections to treat all manner of disease, altering the genes of our children before they are born, and establishing manned bases on Mars. We'll be talking to artificial intelligences more than we talk to ourselves. Of course, all that assumes global warming doesn't enter a runaway feedback loop before we find a way to ameliorate the consequences of pouring a trillion tons of greenhouse gases into our atmosphere. I can't think of a time in human history filled with more wonder and terror than the one ahead of us. Why would I want to write about anything else? Atriox is relatively new to the franchise. 
Having been introduced in Halo Wars 2, how did you approach getting into his headspace when writing scenes involving him? With a lot of help. I enjoy writing alien characters because it gives me a chance to experiment with drives and moralities that would strike a wrong note in human characters. I mean, they have different physiologies which is going to affect everything from what they eat to how they reproduce and organize themselves. At the same time, we all have to eat, we are young, and interact with our peers. So I start with the commonalities and ask myself how the biology of an alien species might alter them compared to human societies. This provides some basic touchstones that keep alien characters relatable and comprehensible, while still being different enough in motivation and behavior to prevent them from just seeming like humans in alien skins. Generally, the editors and readers seem to respond pretty well to this approach, as I'm often complimented on my portrayal of alien characters. But when it comes to Atriox, I never seem to go far enough in the first draft, Every time I've written him, the 343 editors have come back with notes saying he needs to be even more ruthless and cunning, more decisive and brutal. They're right, of course, and Atriox's character always seems to be spot on by the time we put the book to bed, but it is a process getting there. Final question, how are you? I assume you're referring to my open heart surgery in 2022, which caused nearly a year-long delay for outcasts. Honestly, I haven't felt this good in 20 years. I've always loved to exercise, but over the past couple of decades, I just kept finding it harder and harder to do. Because it was happening so gradually, I didn't pay much attention other than to think, man, getting older really sucks. Then, in the winter of 2022, I began to grow short of breath when I really shouldn't have, taking the trash out or climbing a flight of stairs. I knew I had a congenital heart defect, a bicuspid aortic valve, because my mother has also had one, but she didn't need to have hers replaced until she was 70, and I was well short of that. I finally put the clues together and realized it was time to get checked, and sure enough, we began a battery of tests. Each time we did a new test, they moved up the date for the next one. By the time I saw the surgeon, I said, I only need two months to finish my book. Can't we put this off that long? He answered, if you put the surgery off two months, you're never going to finish that book. Long story short, it was a long recovery, but I lost 25 pounds and can exercise as hard as I want. It feels great. And so, that is pretty much everything I have to say about Halo Outcasts. Well, actually, I have a ton to say about this book. I loved it, and a special thank you to Mr. Denning for answering my questions. Speaking of, Troy, I know I have asked you a lot of questions, but I must know, purely for my sake, were Keely and Vale a thing? I can't be left in the dark here. The fanfiction writer and fan artist within me demands content. I need to know. <laughs> Other than that, <laughs> 10 out of 10 awesome book. I will see you in the cosmos, friends.